Good morning. I am so pleased to welcome you all to PAX's POC conference, day two. I am Carrie Hausmann. I am the partnership coordinator for PAX's POC team, and I'll be your facilitator for this morning. We're incredibly glad that you all can join us for this really unique and global online event. We have uh, a really wide variety of protection experts from around the world joining us today, from uniformed services and police, from think tanks and research institutions, from community-based organizations and NGOs, and from the diplomatic services, uh, field missions, and among others. We're very happy to have such a wealth of knowledge and expertise in our virtual room today, and we really look forward to the collective experience of sharing lessons learned, experiences from the field, uh, and sharing recommendations for how we can truly advance our field together. The purpose of today's program is to explore concepts around human security from a civilian perspective. How do local communities living in situations of conflict experience conflict, prioritize their protection needs, and articulate these to the protection actors who are responsible for providing security? And how can the international community better utilize evidence from the field and engage in community uh, engagement processes to inform more effective and inclusive POC in practice? So we'll start off this morning with a foundational discussion on what we really mean by human security and explore the different definitions and perceptions uh, of this concept that's often really left open to interpretation. We'll then follow with a session on voices from the field, highlighting some of Fox's work in South Sudan to generate data and dialogue between civilians and authorities on civilian protection needs. After lunch, we'll have a panel of experts joining us from Iraq um, on navigating community engagement in periods of uncertainty. And we'll conclude the day with two concurrent sessions, one to present research from the field on human security conditions in Iraq and the Sahel region, and another on civilian perceptions of transitional peace processes in South Sudan. I might be a little bit biased, but I think it's gonna be a really thrilling program today. Before we dive into the content for this morning's session, I'd like to start with a few housekeeping notes uh, so that you understand a bit about our program and our conference platform. Please, I welcome you to take a tour of our virtual platform to acquaint yourself with the full program, all of our distinguished speakers, um, and to get a sense of the different types of session formats that we have available. We have live panels uh, and presentations. We'll have a lot of pre-recorded presentations from the field interactive Q&A and discussions, breakout sessions, and live polls. Please engage as actively as possible to both give and receive as much as possible from the event itself. And what would a conference be without opportunities for networking with our fellow attendees and presenters? Uh, we have two ways to facilitate networking through our virtual platform. First, we have a meet and greet tab where you can search for and connect directly with all of your fellow attendees and speakers. Um, here, you can see who's online, you can send direct chat messages, and even schedule live video conversations through the platform itself. If you haven't already done so, we encourage you to edit your own profile to make sure that you share the information and the details you would like, and to add a profile photo um, in so that you can connect with people that way through the meet and greet networking space. We also have networking islands where we'll invite you to visit, particularly during our coffee and lunch breaks where you can engage with one another around themes of mutual interest. Note that it is a, a virtual reality space that works best on Google Chrome uh, browsers. The last major section of our platform is a resource library where you can find a wealth of really valuable curated content about the entire conference themes, but also ones relevant and specific to each theme uh, and session for today. Uh, there will also be a variety of opportunities for you to respond to poll questions uh, and to provide us feedback during the day um, on the conference platform homepage. So we really recommend that you do so. Engage with one another, give us feedback, um, and let us know what we can do to improve throughout the conference. If you do encounter any technical difficulties throughout the event, please feel free to visit the live help desk that's available on the conference homepage in the menu screen. And we do encourage you certainly to post about the event interesting takeaways uh, from our distinguished speakers. If you do so, uh, we encourage you to use the following hashtag PAXPOC2020. Um, and please do, if you capture images or important points during the event, do attribute these accordingly to our speakers. 
And finally, remember that all sessions are being recorded and we'll be sharing these publicly on our website, protectionofcivilians.org after the event. Thank you already in advance for all of you for participating so actively today. And thank you as well to our generous partners at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the Netherlands, the Department of Stabilization and Humanitarian Affairs for their support to Pax's POC work. Now onto this morning's content. So we elected to start the day with a broader discussion on definitions of human security and what this means in practice. We'll hear from three really wonderful speakers with three very different perspectives. And we wanna also hear from you. While we can all agree that human security is a critical foundational concept, in practice we all have different definitions, interpretations, and ways of operationalizing it in our own contexts. So there's this poll live for you to provide your input. In general, if you would like to participate in polls or in the Q&A throughout this presentation, note that you might need to exit the full screen mode on your browser so that you can access the Slido module. So for those of you who have seen the poll, we're asking what is the definition of human security that most resonates with you and your context in which you live or work? Individuals are free from fear or threat of physical harm. Communities are protected against cross-cutting challenges to their survival, livelihoods, and dignity. And civil agencies, military, and police coordinate and ensure inclusive protection. I think we can see that there are some different perspectives, um, some different concepts that are resonating, but what seems to be sort of winning the day at the moment is a pretty broad, inclusive uh, perception of human security that contains all of the myriad types of uh, threats and opportunities um, that are necessary for civilians to live their full lives. Right. With that, um, I'd like to continue on and invite our speakers to join us. While they're presenting, please feel free to submit any questions that you have using the Q&A function. So we'll queue these up and have them ready for our discussion um, at the end of the session. I'll begin first by introducing our first distinguished speaker. Lieutenant General Shalesh Denaikar was appointed as the force, force commander of the United Nations mission in South Sudan in July 2019. He's enjoyed a long and distinguished career with the Indian Armed Forces, spanning 37 years, where he has tenanted important command and staff tenures in challenging operational environments. He previously served as Commandant of the Infantry School and Additional Director General of Military Operations at Army Headquarters from 2017 to 2018. Prior to that, he commanded a division, a recruit training center, and a brigade, among other appointments within the Indian Armed Forces. From 1996 to 1997, he served in the United Nations peacekeeping mission in Angola, and from 2008 to 2009 in the United Nations mission in Sudan. He earned a Master's of Philosophy in Defense and Strategic Studies. Lieutenant General Tanaikar will deliver his remarks via a pre-recorded message, but technology and other conditions allowing, he will join us live for the Q&A following the other presentations. Good day to participants of this program. I thank PAX for inviting me to share my views on human security and community engagement. As a force commander UNMIS for the last 18 months, I will speak of my experiences in South Sudan. Sudan is one of the classic cases for study of human security in our times. Landlocked country, a mix of swamps, grasslands, and tropical forests. It has only 200 kilometers of paved road. Its different regions are connected by dirt tracks, virtually unpassable during the wet season of four to five months. In its long struggle for independence from Sudan, it lost 1.5 million lives and more than 4.5 million displaced. It is, it is a land of numerous ethnic groups, a mix of pastoral and agricultural communities. They unitedly fought the war of liberation, but post-independence in 2011, a deadly civil war has claimed more than 383,000 lives. The ceasefire of December 2017 is holding and the peace agreement is under implementation. The young nation is struggling to find unity in its diversity. It has a low human development index ranking of 187 out of 189 countries. More than 7 million people, 60% of its population is food insecure. 1.6 million are displaced internally and 2.2 million have sought refuge in neighboring countries. 5.1 million have, uh, were provided life-saving assistance and protection services during the current year. 650,000 are affected by floods over the last six months. 
the humanitarian appeal for south sudan currently stands at usd 1.9 billion to me human security principally means security of life and security of property does the citizen feel safe and secure in his chosen environment is he able to freely trade and enjoy the property he owns are there reliable mechanisms to resolve disputes transparently and justly do women have equal rights can life be lived with dignity in south sudan unfortunately human security is conspicuous by its absence economic hardship food insecurity poor education and health care lack of employment and outdated practices all feed in to create a culture of violence that destabilizes society the safeguarding of human security is a challenge in a state with weak institutional framework across all its pillars individuals and communities will arm themselves when the state is unable or unwilling to protect owning a weapon becomes culturally acceptable and a sign of masculinity in a undp survey of 2016 15% households held at least one firearm and there are an estimated 601000 illicit arms in circulation in south sudan at the heart of violence is a society moved in archaic practices surprisingly unaffected by civilizational progress livestock the symbol of wealth power and status drives conflict through theft and competition for scarce pasture in the dry season violence erupts without notice minor incidents could escalate speedily pitching youth and communities against each other in a frenzy of senseless brutality in a few hours hundreds of killed thousands displaced villages raised to ground the government could be incapable of response often the distinction between regular and irregular forces is unclear and interchangeable regular forces can be easily overwhelmed by community militias who mobilize and regroup in large numbers with military precision in an incident 3 months ago 78 soldiers were killed in a few hours by community militia over a minor altercation communal differences can be manipulated for political ends when and how to intervene in a politically charged armed tribal conflict is a problem while armed fighters attack and kill each other civilians are the victims of violence unmiss engagement becomes vital military force protects deters provides hope saves lives however it may complicate a delicate situation to include wild villainous charges of prejudice and partisanship force invariably begets force prevention through robust community engagement rather than robust use of force is a good strategy for peacekeeping however in the absence of unifying local and national leadership and efficient self governance mechanisms it is an uphill task but there are success stories engagement through workshops on conflict related sexual violence and human rights has brought criminals to justice agreements on seasonal pastoral migration has contributed to peace freedom of movement trade and commerce between areas held by opposing parties has brought in stability politicians are compelled to listen to civil society and consider policy changes communal violence demands a multi skilled engagement fusing local with national efforts synchronized and coordinated it needs to be consultative enduring process done in an environment of trust it must yield a compromise it should not be a knee jerk reaction to individual episodes of violence unmiss bases are in principal towns remote from areas prone to violence temporary basing of troops and civil experts in the midst of warring communities for extended duration is necessary there is always a constituency that desires peace the women the elders local chiefs need encouragement to begin a dialogue the dialogue is slow to start and needs patience to build confidence and hope in the initial stages possibility of failure is high and has also led to a fresh bout of violence local and national leadership must be simultaneously engaged acrimonious positions could mellow as the dialogue expands the military and the police have their own unique roles human rights violation require investigation and accountability must be speedily established humanitarian services need quick assessment and deployment a commitment of trust funds and quick impact projects to address some of the underlying administrative and infrastructure deficiencies need consideration local dispute resolution mechanism is necessary if rule of law is to replace the rule of the gun multidimensional community engagement sustained over time 
will reduce intensity and frequency of violence. It is only a well-resourced, skilled, representative local self-government that can successfully end this, the violence that afflicts large parts of South Sudan. I note a few major challenges in the present environment. Firstly, early warning and accessibility is imperative. The mission has a good system of conflict mapping and early warning. However, the capacity to deploy troops and staff in time is poor, particularly in the wet season. Significant improvement of mobility across wet clay soil, marshland, and rivers to access conflict zones is desirable. Secondly, uninterrupted, multidimensional, robust engagement is not easy to achieve. Engagements need to be continuous, enduring, and move beyond workshops and short meetings. Preventive deployment for duration of three months and more promotes trust and possibilities of favorable settlements. Thirdly, Politics of disruption is always at work. Engagements tend to be frustrating and prone to failure in the absence of a representative local government. Fourthly, prominence of women engagements is paramount. Women peacekeepers provide the much needed confidence, sense of fairness and trust. The mission needs to scale up its women peacekeepers from the present 5% to at least 15% soon. Lastly, Dispute resolution mechanisms need to be established. Reliable, authoritative, effective, and well-recognized dispute resolution mechanism is imperative for dispensation of justice. Mobile courts in remote areas for grievance, grievance redressal is a solution. Thank you. Thank you very much for those reflections, Lieutenant General. I find it very useful that you've so clearly articulated for us some of the, uh, the scale, actually, of the complex human security challenges facing South Sudan, as well as the complexity of the security landscape in such stark terms. But I'd also like to thank you for posing some sort of success stories and some things, some recommendations for things that we as a field can build upon in South Sudan. So we look forward to hearing more from you in our interactive discussion. I'd next like to introduce our following speaker, Major Marnix Provost, is a major in the Royal Netherlands Army, currently working at the Ministry of Defense as a policy officer on conflict prevention. He's held that position for over a year, having previously served for over two decades as an infantry officer in a variety of operational functions. During this period, he was deployed to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Afghanistan, and Mali gaining valuable insights concerning the effects of military activities in contemporary conflicts. Uh, the major holds a master's degree in military strategic studies, and he wrote his thesis on the interaction between terrorism, ethnic nationalism, and organized crime in the Sahel. Please, I hand it over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, and let me start by saying to you all that it is an honor for me to be speaking here, um, especially in the uh, company of such honorable fellow speakers. So I was asked by PAX to speak on this conference about what role human security plays in my work, which is integrating conflict prevention in policy development for the Dutch MOD. Well, in this short presentation, I will briefly cover the roots and principles of conflict prevention in the Dutch MOD, uh, the concept of human security, and the role it plays in policy development for the Dutch MOD. And I will illustrate this with some practical examples. And in the run-up to this conference, um, I was asked to deliver a quote that could be used for promotional purposes. And not being very eloquent myself, I chose a quote by Kofi Annan, who stated in 2005, I quote, I argue that we will not enjoy development without security or security without development. But I also stress that we will not enjoy either without universal respect for human rights, end of quote. And I think he is right. And luckily for me, uh, so does the Dutch MFA and MOD, at least so it seems. So it is without doubt that security and development are interlinked and that both thrive in environments in which basic human rights are respected. And the ba most basic human right is freedom of fear, conflict and violence. And this forms the essential foundation for building peaceful and prosperous societies in which that other basic human right, uh, freedom of want can be addressed. 
So security is key to development because violence and armed conflict often destroy the progress that has been made through development projects. And on the other hand, peace and stability cannot be attained through exclusively military approaches with a very narrow focus on security. And the Netherlands is convinced that lasting peace and security will benefit from a people-oriented approach and inclusive policy. And protection of civilians and women and children in particular is an inextricable part of the Dutch integrated foreign and security policy. This notion forms a normative framework within which the government operates and it determines how the Netherlands deploys its policy instruments, one of which is of course the use of its armed forces. And the Netherlands Integrated International Security Strategy or IISS, GBVS in Dutch, rests on three pillars, preventing, defending and strengthening. And its aim is to provide an anticipatory and preventive security approach over the long term preventing insecurity uh, wherever possible. And in practice, this entails both ensuring credible deterrence together with our allies and devoting attention to the root causes of drivers of insecurity, such as poverty and climate change. Conflict prevention is important for both security and development. And where people cannot live in safety, sustainable poverty reduction and the development of uh, rule of law are practically impossible. And in its core, interministerial conflict prevention focuses on the root causes and breeding grounds for insecurity. An anticipatory and preventive security approach requires a strong intelligence and information capability, including insights into the intentions and motivations of other actors. And this is crucial and one of the contributions of the Dutch MOD in conflict prevention. The Netherlands is investing in its information and intelligence capability in order to enhance the knowledge and capacity to identify and subsequently prevent threats of conflict. And in order to strengthen strength, um, the overall early warning, early action capability, the Netherlands works on an integrated conflict prevention agenda which combines uh, security, foreign trade, development cooperation together with the efforts to tackle the structural root causes of potential conflicts. Starting points for this integrated and actually interministerial conflict prevention agenda is um, our, our human security and a people-oriented approach. However, the difficulty with the pillar of prevention is that its results are often less visible and measurable while political urgency is often low or even absent. And this makes it important, important to set clear strategic goals and to have patience and long-term commitment in addressing the long-term causes of insecurity. And furthermore, preventive capabilities should consist of both military and civilian components. Civil missions, diplomatic efforts, as well as options for economic and military escalation or even intervention are crucial capabilities to prevent the outbreak of violent conflicts. And furthermore, alongside civilian actors, armed forces can play a role in establishing legitimate local military capabilities. And I will address this later on. It is probably by now becoming clear uh, that the security approach of the Netherlands is rooted in the concept of human security, with one of its basic principles being a focus on the interests and freedoms of the individual human being. So what is human security then? Well, human security refers to the security of the individual human being rather than the security of states. And the primacy of human rights is what distinguishes the human security approach from traditional state-centered security approaches. Human security approaches person-centered security as an integral element of international peace and security and recognizes that the security of states is essential but not sufficient to guarantee the security and well-being of in individual humans. And furthermore, human security focuses on both military and non-military threats to humans. Finally, providing security is then considered a continuum, starting with conflict prevention, extending over intervention and ending at conflict resolution. Conflict prevention is thus one of the key principles of a human security framework and should form the basis of any security strategy. Developing a strategy to prevent a conflict requires thorough analysis of structural causes of conflict, such as political, social, and economical inequalities, 
exclusion and grievances. This is where conflict sensitivity comes into play. Conflict sensitivity means that you are able to understand the context in which you operate or plan to operate, and that you understand the interaction between your intervention and this context, and that you are able to act upon this understanding in order to avoid negative impacts or maximize positive impacts. Conflict analysis is the central component of conflict sensitive practice, while conflict sensitivity should have an important and leading pro, uh, role in policy development and running programs. Implementing human security based on, um, sorry, implementing the human security based security strategy requires policy coherence with a close alignment of strategic goals and the deployment of a wide range of available instruments. Think of the activities carried out by overseas diplomatic missions, investments through development cooperation, measures to address the root causes of instability, economic reforms as a way to encourage political and social reforms, and last but not least, the deployment of armed forces and police. And from a military practitioner's perspective, human security already has a direct and indirect influence on military operations which is through the adherence to the Geneva Conventions, law of armed conflict, international human, humanitarian law, rules of engagement, the establishment of international criminal courts, etc., but also by the always present and ever-growing military interest in gaining local popular support in conflict zones. No military actor can afford to ignore the local population in a given area of operations, and more often than not, community engagement will be an important part of the operational plan. So what is then the importance of community engagement? Well, in order to be successful, both national and multilateral security initiatives should be based on local strategies. In order to understand the context in which you operate and the interaction between an intervention and the local context, one should engage local communities. And going a step, step further, Progress in security and development can only be made by making use of existing local capacities for peace, and this makes community engagement so important. Local involvement in and ownership of security initiatives is again a key component of, humans, of a human security approach. And initiatives should be based on local perspectives and the complexity of situations on the ground. So how do we undertake this then? Well, from my own experience, I am convinced that the Dutch armed forces traditionally already have a people-centric approach to operations in which uh, human security in a way seems innate. In many theaters of operations, military personnel engage with local populations in order to enhance situational understanding, which enables a conflict-sensitive approach in policy development and programming. The enhancement of situational understanding can be done by a range of personnel, from the military attaché at the diplomatic mission abroad, to personnel of the Civil Military Interaction Command, as well as special forces or any other military actor at any level. In a way, every soldier at any level uh, should be considered a sensor that contributes to situational understanding, which uh, provides uh, a conflict-sensitive approach. Well, which, what uh, role does human security then play within the Dutch MAD? Well, in a way, um, the team in which I work is the very proof that the Dutch MOD takes human security serious and that it has a role in policy development. With our team, we are able to contribute on behalf of the Dutch MOD to the interministerial working group on early warning, early action, and thus put conflict prevention in specific areas of interest on the agenda of interministerial decision-making structures. And furthermore, we are able to provide specific policy advice from the perspective of conflict prevention to these very same structures. Due to the classification of information, I cannot go into detail concerning specific countries or regions, uh, but trust me, um, this is high on the agenda. Furthermore, we have commissioned a research um, by the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, studies concerning policy development in security sector reform. For years, the international community has spent considerable effort to promote stability by reforming and strengthening security sectors in fragile and conflict-prone states. And these efforts have met with mixed results. Empirical evidence shows that security sector reform missions have frequently failed to bring stability, 
In fact, when the security sector forms part of and sustains dysfunctional security structures, SSR interventions risk further undermining rather than promoting stability. However, evidence also suggests that a security sector that is accountable and inclusive and abides by the rule of law can effectively provide stability to the state and its people. Um, the report that we commissioned uh, offers a security sector's assessment framework uh, to assess security sector's potential contrib contribution to stability. This framework yields a security sector uh, yields a security sector topology of six um, security sectors based on an empirical mapping of security sectors in 82 countries. Um, six uh, types, the criminal, the repressive, the oppressive, the fragmented, the transitioning, and the stable. And this framework is intended to facilitate understanding of a security sector's potential um, contribution to stability by providing this workable framework. This helps us as policymakers to better understand how and why security sectors contribute or undermine stability. And um, this way, we can tailor the design of policy accordingly. The research, uh, in the end, provided a framework to help assessing a security sector's potential contribution to stability, um, as well as a way to provide policy advice. Another initiative was commissioning a report by Safer World, um, which is due to be presented in the very near future on conflict sensitivity in the Dutch armed forces. And this report aims to inform policymakers and support uh, strategic planners to develop conflict sensitive approaches specific to uh, military activities. So to conclude, I hope I have given you all an idea of how human security uh, forms a part of the Dutch integrated international uh, security strategy and how it subsequently finds its way into the Dutch MOD. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions, should there be any. Thank you so much for sharing these reflections from the perspective of the Ministry of Defense. It's really valuable to hear such a clear summary of the Dutch military security strategy as it relates to protection of civilians and human security, and the recognition in particular of the needs to address non-military threats to security. I already see that this is triggering some really interesting questions from our audience, so we look forward to discussing with you further. Finally, I'd like to introduce our last speaker. Jeana Abdullah is co-founder and director of programs at the Human Security Collective. Since 2013, she has worked at AH HSC to protect and expand the operational and political space for civil society and to bridge the gap between social and security domains to implement more effective and comprehensive human security strategies. With more than 25 years of experience, Gianna has worked extensively in areas of conflict transformation and community leadership, and for the last seven years specifically, in the field of preventing violent extremism. She has acted as a LEAS consultant for the OSCE in developing a curriculum on human security and youth leadership in the prevention of violent extremism. Gianna studied cultural anthropology at the University of Leiden and international relationships at the Klingendale Institutes. I hand it over to you. Thank you, Kari, for the introduction and the invitation to speak at this important conference on protection of civilians. Human security frames our actions focused on people and communities. When I received the invitation, I realized there are so many entry points to discuss human security. I gave it some thought and decided that as a practitioner providing training on inclusive leadership for human security, I prefer to run you through one of the many stories told by community leaders we work with across the world. The entry point being a civil society perspective on human security and community engagement. Civil society defined as non-governmental, voluntary groups of people that organize themselves on behalf of interest groups or local communities. The concept of protection of civilians acknowledges the fact that governments have the responsibility to ensure the safety of citizens. This is agreed upon in international law as well as national legal frameworks. And in the case where governments are not able or not willing to do so, we see the vital role of an independent civil society stepping in to address basic needs. And when it comes to improving the protection of all civilians, regardless where they live, their age, gender, ethnicity, religious, or any other background, 
we also see it as a moral duty of the international community to help out. Um, can I have the slide up, please? Now, let me introduce you to the context in which Miriam lives. She's one of the many extraordinary community leaders I was privileged to work with. And for reasons of privacy, I changed her name. Back in 2014, I provided a series of training in Gaza. It was just after the summer attack during which for two months nonstop, Israel dropped 400 tons of bombs together with 6,000 airstrikes. And just to provide you an idea of the intensity of this, one needs to understand Gaza is an area ranked as the third most densely populated area in the world, with 1.8 million Palestinians living on 362 square kilometers. This attack had the effect of displacing some 500,000 Palestinians, whilst electricity to hospitals was cut off, leaving thousands with basic med medical care. When Miriam enrolled in our training, she was a young mother and a young mother and, and a teacher. She graduated from the secondary school in the beginning of 2000, and this was at the height of the second Palestinian uprising against the Israeli occupation. Being so affected by the stories of dead and injured Palestinians, she decided to study journalism so she would be able to report about human rights violations to the international community. But unfortunately, her parents refused her to study journalism. They told her girls can't be late and they shouldn't talk to men. She studied English instead and became a teacher. Miriam became part of a dedicated group of young Palestinian community leaders. They were trained to apply a human security approach towards safety in their communities. And as you can imagine, it felt a little awkward to continue our training on human security right after the summer attack, witnessing what total lack of protection of civilians looks like. Yet, as soon as I reunited with the group, I felt the enormous steadfastness to continue learning and applying new skills to serve their people. Even though some of the group members became part of the data, stating that 70% of Gaza's total population had become aid dependent with no prospects for economic development. After the workshop, Miriam confided in me a dilemma she faced in her personal dom domain. Surprisingly, this dilemma had at first little to do with the terrifying experience of living the daily bombardments for two months. Loss of, loss of beloved ones, loss of homes and incomes and lack of basic services, including water, electricity and medical care. Listening to her story, though, it became clear how entangled her personal dilemma was with all the other vulnerabilities in her community, realizing the complexity and the interrelatedness of this. Our work focuses on what citizens themselves can do to work towards safety in their communities. It is preventative and practices a non-violent approach, independent of explicit political and security interests. It consists of working with community leaders who are trained to conduct action research and develop tangible initiatives to improve human security. The action research is to gain a deeper understanding of the perceptions of citizens with regard to safety in their neighborhoods not condemning them, but truly trying to understand their situation, listening with empathy. The questions focus on the issues they feel most passionate about to work on. And in the case of Miriam, it was about women's rights, lack of women's rights, whereas others identify different topics, as you can see on the mind map. Many, many other human security concerns. We view this type of analysis critical in building the resilience of citizens and most essential that people themselves define the issues that threaten the security of individuals and their communities. Even though this type of action research covers a comprehensive understanding of what citizens perceive as security threats, we still too often find this type of research ignored by policymakers particularly when it comes to preventative security policies. And worse than not being recognized is the fact that some governments today continue to repress civil society, ensuring they will not press their authorities for any public services, freedoms or rights. 
And likewise, we see many governments unintended or deliberately limiting civil society's ability to provide human security due to counter-terrorism laws. This also restricts the much-needed much financial support to them, especially when these citizens have a legitimate set of political grievances and self-determination aims protected by international law. Over the past two decades, security measures under the pretext of counter-terrorism have deeply affected freedom of expression, freedom of movement and freedom of assembly. We witness governments disregarding human rights by gathering intelligence information of people. This is not only immoral, it also leads to further undermining human rights. We witness how these governments increasingly think of securitizing entire communities. This has the effect that citizens, especially during these times of great uncertainty, welcome popularism over human rights, feeding into conspiracy thinking and polarization in our societies. This puts social activists like Miriam, the ones who are trying to steer positive change at increasing risk. So rather than securitizing entire communities this way, there is a huge need to recognize that people have perceived or real human security concerns. And rather than seeing civil society as an entity that should be controlled, it is essential that people like Miriam can operate independently from governments. Therefore, we need to do the opposite of securitizing entire communities and de-securitize. And this is exactly why a human security approach is needed, and it, as it does not manipulate citizens as security assets. Instead, it emphasizes the empowerment of civil society to participate in identifying security challenges and contributing towards positive change. It also requires gaining a deeper understanding of why people in the first place are drawn into this way of thinking, acknowledging we are in the midst of complex dynamics, which requires a more holistic approach towards safety in our communities. Back to Miriam. As a young woman from a rural area in the south of Gaza, Miriam never thought she would be given an opportunity to become a civil society activist. This is not particular to the context of Gaza. In the Netherlands, there are also young men living in marginalized communities who never thought they would be given a chance to take the lead in designing and implementing activities to improve their communities. Miriam recently ran a social media campaign which aims to reduce the dangers of blackmail against young women. She was able to convince many community members, such as family elders, police commanders and faction leaders of this campaign, whereas initially they opposed the idea. For that, she, she scheduled a hearing with members of security institutions and muhtars. There's the ones who are they have the decision-making power for community-related matters, as most people in Gaza still prefer to solve this kind of issue through tribal reconciliation. Miriam also managed to convince the family members of these girls that their privacy was guaranteed, and this way she was able to record testimonies. Through cooperation with the Women Police Department, a hotline was launched for women to report on blackmail cases, this was another remarkable achievement, as at first they had refused to cooperate, finding the topic far too sensitive. The campaign resulted in greater awareness and the need to protect women and find a safe way to overcome blackmail, preventing femicide and suicide amongst these victims. As a concluding note, it is essential we safeguard an independent civil society to be able to take up their role in working towards positive change. It takes courage and willingness of governments to recognize the fact that they cannot address safety by securitizing entire communities. Without the involvement of an independent civil society and where needed, the support of the international community, we can provide human security for all citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanne, for providing us with this perspective from civil society, but also from yourself as a practitioner. 
uh, and as well for grounding us in the real life experiences of civilians living in situations of conflict like Miriam and her community. I think this actually provides a really nice segue into our discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank Major Provost and Lieutenant General Tanaykar as well for their contributions. While I welcome you all back to the virtual stage, I'd like to pose another poll question to our audience. And we'd like you to please respond to this question from your own perspective and in your own context. So in your context, which actor is most responsible for providing security and protecting civilians? So we have a variety of options, national governments, the national military, UN missions, NATO, civil society, community self-protection groups, or civilians themselves. As we know, many of those living in more complex security landscapes might have a myriad of different security actors on the ground with some degree of responsibility for providing protection. Uh, and in other contexts, the landscape is a little bit more uh, less complex. Here currently, for a lot of the people in the audience, we're seeing that the national government has primary responsibility. But interestingly enough, I think maybe responding to Gianna's presentation, a sense that civil society might have even a direct role to play in, in protection. While we continue to get your uh, reflections on the poll, um, I'll go ahead and uh, invite you to start also contributing more questions to our speakers for the Q&A portion. We still have about 15 minutes with which to engage with one another, so I'll remind you with just a few key points about how we will moderate the session. Everyone is welcome to submit questions using also the Slido module uh, where you're responding to the poll. Please, if you have questions for specific panelists, do direct them to those individuals. Uh, welcome as well to any of you who are joining via Facebook Live. Feel free to submit questions there as well, and our moderators will do their best to uh, make sure that we can integrate that with our platform here. We'll publish questions on your screen in front of you so you can upvote or like questions that you really want to make sure that we answer. Uh, hopefully we'll get to as many questions as time and technology allow. And please do remember that this is a public event that will be recorded and shared later. Thank you all. I see a couple of questions already have come in, so I'll start with those. Um, and I'll direct maybe the first two at once to Major Provost. If I can ask you to respond to with what indicators does the Netherlands Ministry of Defense aim to measure its impact on conflict prevention? And secondly, how does the Dutch military train officers and soldiers on human security? Is there a doctrine on this? Over to you, Major Provost. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much for these interesting uh, questions. I'll start with the uh, second one. Um, how we, um, uh, well, integrate, uh, as you called it, human security into the training of our officers. Uh, well, I, I think that um, gaining popular support is like a basic principle in uh, training at all levels and uh, community engagement is also an, an integral integral part of all our uh, military operations. And I think as such, uh, more or less every soldier in the Dutch armed forces has the notion that armed conflict uh, currently takes place amongst people and that training is automatically uh, focused on that. If I look at my own military career, um, starting in the 1990s, uh, already we learned how to interact with uh, civilians how to gain popular support, um, but also how to adhere to rules of engagement, uh, international humanitarian law and law of armed conflict. So I hope that more or less uh, answers the question. Uh, and to be more specific, at the moment, there is not a specific doctrine. It's more or less ingrained in all training activities. So. Okay, thank you for your response. Uh, yes, we, and there was a second question should as well. I respond? The second one, yes, yes please. Um, that's that's very difficult. Uh, conflict prevention is is uh, almost immeasurable. Uh, what what the effects of your uh, activities are, 
the most basic thing is that um, if there is no violent conflict uh, happening, then more or less you, sh you are successful. But it is very difficult to identify the factors which have uh, contributed uh, to that. Um, you can only estimate it. Uh, and of course, um, I, I think conflict prevention, and I hope that became clear from uh, my, my explanation, um, it's, it's like an interministerial uh, effort. Uh, the primacy lies with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to coordinate all policy instruments. And for the Dutch MOD, we only have a very, very small part um, in, in conflict prevention. Um, but I think in the end, the only thing uh, you can measure the, the success of conflict prevention is the fact that no violent conflict breaks out in an area where you have focused your efforts. Thank you very much for those reflections. We also have a question for Lieutenant General Tanaykar. What mechanisms does the United Nations have in place to ensure civilians continue to be protected as it is withdrawing its troops from its POC sites in South Sudan? And also, if you have any uh, reflections on the previous questions, feel free to do so as well. Repeat about this POC. I couldn't hear the last part of your question. So the, the general question is what mechanisms does the UN mission have in place to ensure civilians continue to be protected as it is withdrawing its troops from POC sites across South Sudan? And I was wondering as well if you have any reflections secondarily on this question about measuring um, the effectiveness of conflict prevention. Firstly, uh, yes, troops are, have been withdrawn from protection of civilian sites because they don't need protection as of now. Uh, during the initial stages, initial period after the after the conflict in 2016 and later on, there was there was a threat to life. Subsequently, that threat has diminished considerably, if not totally. Uh, civilians in sites are not isolated; they are much part of the society. They work out, they work outside, they earn a living outside. Uh, they move outside freely, so the kind of protection which was once required is not there. So there is no uh, need to have a permanent static presence of troops around around these sites. Uh, but we do know that that is one. So although there is, it's not a camp, security camp as such, uh, the U United Nations uh, does have a responsibility to protect. So uh, there are patrols, uh, there is a QRF that is on standby and in case these uh, POC sites as they were, now they are IDP camps, come under any kind of threat or a risk, uh, UNMIS military will act aggressively to see that they are protected. <clears throat> the second thing is about uh, how do you gauge and how do you gauge your, gauge your effectiveness? Uh, how do you, how do you uh, see that uh, the measures that you've taken have been effective? It is not necessarily the, the unfortunate part of this is uh, even though a single life lost is too much, you should also uh, count on the, the, the lives that you've saved. Uh, in, in, a, in a complex environment, you may not be able to protect everyone, uh, but you may be able to save thousands of lives. So that uh, should give you some comfort, even though I do add that even a single life lost is a life too much. But in conflicts which, uh, which cannot be predicted uh, with, with any degree of accuracy, where uh, you could generally be in a reactive mode rather than a preventive mode, uh, in that case, you must, you must uh, satisfy yourself that you've taken the right actions, you've taken it at the right time, you may not have been able to save everybody, but you've saved a large number. Had you, had you not intervened, the conscious consequences would have been disastrous. Uh, so let us also view it positively, although our aim is to save each and every life. Thank you very much for that response. I'd like to ask a question or two now to Jeanna Abdullah from the Human Security Collective. From our audience, how can civil society engage with national governments or militaries, which in some cases also may be perpetrators of violence against their own civilians? And a question from me, moderator privilege, 
Uh, you talked about the need to go about desecuritizing communities. Uh, what advice do you have though, to those of us specifically who work also directly with security institutions and conflicts? To you, Gianna. Thank you, Kari. Um, yes, how to engage with governments and the military who are also part and parcel of, um, um, yeah, making it impossible for um, for people to, to live in safety. Um, well, I guess uh, the, the most important uh, um, question, answer to that is that um, it's very important that you are able to create safe space for people to allow to talk about grievances. And when I'm talking about that, I mean, it's not only about citizens having to address their grievances to governments and the military, but that you create um, a space where everyone can share their perspectives on the matter and, um, and that you allow uh, the, um, the, the, the grievances to take place. So I think um, it's a very uh, long road to make that possible because it starts with uh, the empowerment of citizens in terms of uh, making them feel that they are ready to take that step to have these uh, discussions also with the government uh, officials and with the military. Um, and yeah, I mean, it also goes back to, you know, how do you measure the results of that when it's something that is a long-term process? So I would say step by step and uh, ensuring that safe space. I have one other question that I'd like to pose um, to all three of you to maybe respond to very quickly, given that we're short on time. From Abigail Watson, how can we ensure that great strategy is always implemented and relatedly that what is needed to ensure community engagement is always given the resources required? If you can each maybe respond uh, in turn. Uh, first to you, Marnix Provost. Yes. Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. How can we ensure that great strategy is always implemented and relatedly that what is needed to ensure community engagement is always given the resources that are required? Yes, that's, that's difficult to answer uh, because as I stated, um, in the end, uh, if you really want to provide human security and um, address uh, conflict prevention, it requires a long-term commitment and uh, the allocation of resources always um, is, is like a uh, political process. Um, and that makes it difficult to ensure that in the long term, um, the required uh, resources and assets and the political urgency and focus um, on, on conflict prevention and on the provision of human security in, in areas where we are active is guaranteed. So. I don't think there's there's like a uh, safeguard to ensure that um, uh, th this great strategy will always uh, continue and um, uh, well provide the desired effects. Thank you. I'll look to Lieutenant General Tanaykar. Do you have a quick response to that as well? Strategy is pretty simple. The commitment has to be enduring. And as we started off with your with your moderation by stating that the uh, the responsibility lies with the with the local government and we as partners can only pay, play do so much we can do we can do actually if you ask me it's just a bandaid over a very deep wound but we need to see that whatever we do uh, is effective uh, but the principal uh, responsibility lies somewhere else and that is that is a very and and in uh, and to actually address conflicts of such nature, it requires resources, it requires time that as international community, we may not have perennially. So we come in to fill a gap. We come in to provide the resources which are not immediately available. We come in to provide the skills which are not immediately available, but our principal job is to see that uh, the local resources, the local government comes up to speed at the fa in the fastest possible time. If you're not able to do that, then uh, you will, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a kind of a temporary measure. I do understand that sometimes uh, the protection is from, 
from the government itself which is harming its own citizens that is a real real complex complex issue but that again needs a very uh, uh, strong political intervention to stop that and that also has to be done in a certain period of time it cannot it cannot go on endlessly so while we as the, while the international community with its skills with its resources with its with its money can should come and should save lives simultaneously we should see that uh, the local government uh, the responsible local local people are able to step up uh, and rise to save to save their own citizens thank you thank you we're just about out of time i do want to give jana if you have just a last sentence of concluding uh, response uh, please feel free and then i will close I our session Thank you, Carrie. Well, I'm just thinking about uh, what the previous speakers have said, and of course, that's more focused on um, when we've passed the, st the stage of prevention. And uh, I'm, one of my greatest appeals would be that we need to invest more in prevention, 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 before it gets too late. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, that's unfortunately all the time we have today for this session. I want to offer sincere gratitude to our speakers today, but also to all of our participants for engaging in such a thoughtful discussion with all of us. We're apologizing, certainly from our side, we did not have the time to answer all of the questions that we received, but we do hope that you reach out to the speakers and to one another and to us to continue these conversations in the networking spaces that we have available through on the Confluence platform. We have a coffee break coming up for the next few minutes. So we invite you to go to the meet and greet space or the networking islands to continue these conversations. Uh, please feel free to share additional questions or feedback with us using the session evaluation forums uh, that we'll post after each event or session. Um, and certainly by email uh, at poc at poxforpeace.nl. And we also hope that you'll join us back here at 1130 for our next session. Uh, which will be on Voices from the Field, where we'll be highlighting PAX's human security survey experiences in South Sudan. Thank you so much, and we'll look forward to seeing you on later on today.